You're listening to the STEM XM podcast, highlighting women in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And now, your host, Mel the Engineer. Hello, I'm your host, Mel the Engineer, and I'm so glad that you're with us today. Here on STEM XM, our aim is to showcase the many career options out there in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, on episode 18, we're going to be learning about another career in water and wastewater. This is the second in a series I'm working on that falls in this category. The first was with Stacy Pissarro in episode 17. She specialized in water and wastewater treatment plant operations. If you didn't listen to that one already, you might want to check it out. Today, we have Christiana Dragas joining us. Christiana is an environmental engineer with special expertise in municipal master planning. Christiana earned a BS in civil engineering with a concentration in water resources from the University of South Florida in 2008. Since graduating, she has worked in environmental engineering consulting, and at the time of recording, she is also serving as the vice president of the Florida Water Environment Association. Let's take a listen to Christiana, and I'll be back with you at the end to share some additional tidbits that Christiana and I discussed that weren't part of the recording. Okay, here we go. Christiana, thank you so much for joining us today on STEM XM. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. So I want to start out with um, some questions about your background. Can you tell us where you grew up? Uh, Yeah, I grew up in New Smyrna Beach, just south of Daytona uh, on the east coast of Florida. And uh, I was born in Ocala. And when you were young... Were there certain subjects that you were interested in as a kid? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, My mom was a science teacher growing up. (laughs) And so as far back as I can remember, um, she had these giant telescopes in, in our front yard uh, sometimes looking up at the moon. Uh, if I ever went to school with her, I was, you know, playing in her physics lab or chemistry lab or whatever it was that she was teaching. Uh, so yeah, I was always much more interested in science and math. Um, but I also, I love art. Uh, I love being creative and I always have, um, and dance and things like that. Um, the only things I really didn't, uh, didn't love for, you know, English and which you actually have to use a lot as an engineer. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's funny. <laughs> uh, but yeah, English history, things like that were not my, not my thing, but I always did really like science and math. So did you struggle to figure out the path that you wanted to go down in college or did you have a pretty good idea? No, I actually, I had no idea, even though my mom, of course, was in my ear the whole time saying, be an engineer, be an engineer, be an engineer. (laughs) Um, I'm glad that I finally listened to her, but, um, so she wasn't an engineer though. She was a teacher. So how... How did she have that advice for you? Uh, well, she knew that I don't quite have the patience to be a teacher, I think. <laughs> um, and I think she knew that I would just be good at it. And, you know, it's probably something that, you know, she's been interested in. If she wasn't an educator, I'm sure that's what she would be doing. Uh, so yeah. Uh, but for college, I definitely did not know what I wanted to do or where I wanted to start. And I actually wound up going to two different community colleges and 
two different universities and took about six years to figure the whole thing out and get my degree. And that's just, you know, my, my undergrad <laughs> with a, an excess of hours <laughs> and things that I really didn't need. Well, walk but us, yeah, I, I, walk us sure. through that real quick. Yeah. So did you like change majors or what, what happened? That, I did. Yeah. I just had a hard time picking out what it, it was that I was going to do. And like, I think a lot of people wonder when they hear engineer, what exactly does that mean? What do you do every day? Um, and so I actually, I started out getting my AA and just didn't quite finish with that over in Daytona before I decided to go to new college. Um, and so I went to new college, the honors college of Florida for, I, I only lasted there a year and I figured out pretty quickly that I just, wasn't going to be happy, um, in that kind of environment. It's a really small school and, uh, I started studying math and, uh, I just, I wanted something more applied than that. Um, I, I figured out. And so I wound up transferring out of that, um, into, uh, what at the time was Manatee Community College, which is now SCF. Um, State College of Florida. And I finished up my AA there and went into the College of Engineering at University of South Florida. And I did not know what kind of engineer I was going to be, um, but I was going to pick something. <laughs> and so I at first I thought computers was going to be it and, you know, that I would do the computer science, uh, computer engineering. And I, I thought it was cool, but I, you know, the writing the code and programming all the time. Um, I just, I knew that I wasn't quite cut out for that. Um, and I mean, honestly, I, I wound up taking in their fundamentals classes that uh, fluid, fluids, you know, intro to fluids, fluid mechanics, um, and dynamics. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. I could do this. And um, I went into civil. I knew I, I didn't want to do bridges. Um, but I didn't know, you know, what other kinds of civil that there were. And I took the classes starting to figure it out. And, um, yeah, I mean, kind of like process of elimination, really. Like, I know I don't want to do that. I know I don't want to do that. And then when I tried fluids on for size, I really, I really liked it. It really interested me, um, and now, you know, fast forward eight years down the road, I, I am doing, you know, a lot of fluids, but I work with hydraulic models, um, which has that computer piece in it that I was interested in. So that's kind of cool that it came full circle. You know, I'm not doing the computer engineering and I'm not doing some other kind of civil or even just, you know, designing in designing the pipelines, but the computerized aspect of um, these big collection uh, and distribution systems. Right. Okay. So that's, that's really cool that those things came together for you. That's awesome. So Thanks. while you were in school, did you do any internships or co-ops? I did. Um, I interned at two different site development um, offices or companies. Uh, one was really small called Jensen and Group here in, uh, it was in Bradenton. And uh, at a firm called Dufresne Henry, which uh, was bought by Stantec. Um, and I was only there for a, for a couple months. Um, and but could you explain for our listeners, what does site development entail? Hmm. And, uh, so 
I do not do site development now, and I'm very happy that I don't. I discovered through those internships that it is something that I'm really not that interested in. Um, but it is basically anything and everything that needs to be done uh, to turn a site, like a, a parcel or a property, from whatever it is currently whether it's just a field, maybe, uh, into a dentist office with parking spaces and um, sidewalks and uh, stormwater drainage. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes into those sites. Um, you know, there there are lots of different requirements depending on where you are. Um, or where the property is located about, you know, certain setbacks or distances that you have to be from, from the boundary, um, of the, of the property. Um, there are certain slopes that you have to adhere to. If you, you know, you, you have to make sure that the stormwater is going to drain off of the site properly. And so within that design, there are, uh, you know, all of those, they're called swales, the little canals that you see um, on pretty much every uh, every site here in, in Florida. Uh, those were all designed and the slopes of them have to be a certain, a certain percent. Uh, so all of that has been thought about a lot by, <laughs> by some people. Right. Okay. So we'll just, we'll just note here for the listeners that, um, there are engineers that focus, um, solely on these things. So there's engineers who do this site de development that you've described. And then there's also engineers that focus, um, solely on stormwater. Um, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm hoping to get, um, get another episode where we talk about that, but, but let's move on with you. Did you say you got another internship too? So those were, uh, so I did two internships in site development with, with two different consulting firms okay. basically. Um, yeah. And I, I knew that it, I it wasn't super interesting to me and I was a little bit scared, um, for my, career and what I was actually going to be doing and whether I was going to like what I had just spent, you know, the past six years in school for. Um, but I wound up finding a, a job at a company that did strictly utilities um, before I graduated from USF. And once I got there, I just knew that it was great. And I was going to be happy with this career decision. <laughs> so awesome. So how did you find that in that initial position? Was it through like a fair or did you, how, how did that happen? Uh, well, it was in the summer of 2008, which I don't know if you remember that or were in the job market at that point in time, Melissa, but it was, um, it was not the best time in the economy. And I actually was, I was sick of driving to Tampa, the University of South Florida uh, campus in Tampa. And so I, um, I sought out different engineering firms that were in the Sarasota area. That's how I basically began my search. And I narrowed it down to uh, a few different firms. And I submitted resumes at all of them, stopped in to say hi. Um, and lo and behold, the one of them, um, you know, had me in for an interview, but they wound up hiring me in their Tampa office. <laughs> oh no, that stinks. <laughs> so you had that but, long I mean, commute. It was, yeah, 
it was understandable though because their Tampa office was a lot bigger than their Sarasota office. And as a new engineer, you need to work with people every day and to learn from them. You can't be in some remote office. I mean, you can, but it's really hard and uh, it's just better for your career um, and your professional development to be just surrounded and immersed in all of the action. Right. That totally makes sense. So talk to us about the development of your career from there and the projects that you got to work on and how you developed in a specialty area. Sure. Um, well, I started off, I mean, day one, (laughs) I was given this awesome, uh, project. It was miles and miles of a 42 inch diameter potable water main. So it's, uh, I mean, almost, you could almost stand up inside of this pipe. Um, and it was through downtown city of Tampa. So I got to design where, where that pipeline was going to go. And it's a lot of coordination with, um, utilities that have, you know, facilities along those routes, because you have to try and avoid what's already there. And there are certain distances that you have to keep from existing wastewater pipes. If it's a, if it's a potable drinking water pipe, um, and all sorts of requirements, um, that you have to think about. So I got to design that, um, as my first project. And then I designed a lot more of, uh, a a lot more pipelines. I did some potable water, wastewater, uh, reclaimed water, even some raw water pipelines. Um, and I got, go ahead. Oh yeah. I want to pause you right there. So, um, you're, you're only the second um, water-related professional I've had on the show. And so I just want to ask you to define for us, um, you mentioned uh, raw water and reclaimed water. Mm-hmm. And we haven't talked about that yet. So could you sure. explain what those mean? Yeah. So raw water um, is basically um, the drinking water before it gets to the treatment plant, before it gets to the drinking water treatment plant, um, to be treated. So it is usually from either a, a big lake or a surface water body. Uh, like in Manatee County, for instance, it's, um, Lake Manatee. And sometimes it comes from, yeah, the aquifer and groundwater. And so that the water is piped and pumped from that source to a treatment plant. And it's treated there uh, to make it free of um, tastes and odors. And then it's sent out into the distribution system. And we call that potable once it's been treated. And then reclaimed, um, reclaimed is, so after you use the water and it goes down your drain, it winds up at a wastewater treatment plant and it goes through a series of processes that purify the water, make it, make it clean again and remove, um, any of the junk that's in there and, then that clean water is then discharged into a reclaimed water system. Um, It can also be discharged back into a surface water body. Um, But like, again, I'll use Manatee County for, as an example, they don't discharge anything to surface water that takes a, a specific permit to do that. And so they, all of their reclaimed water uh, goes to, um, their customers for irrigation. So that's the reclaimed water system. And when you're driving along and you see a purple pipe 
um, or a sign that says, you know, don't drink, no be bear, uh, reclaimed water. That's, that's what it is. It's the purple pipe. Um, that's, that's reclaimed water and blue pipes are the potable drinking water pipes. And, uh, if you ever see a green one, that is for wastewater. Okay. Thank you for, um, sidetracking there a little bit and explaining those to us. No problem. Okay. So, so you got to work on these, these initial really cool projects, um, that you, I'm sure you learned a ton from, and then, and then what happened after that? Um, I, I stayed at that firm for almost four years and I got a little bit of experience in hydraulic modeling and, um, a program called GIS. It's a really robust mapping software that you can just hold a lot of different data in and, I also got a little taste of some some master planning. So, you know, the design that I was doing before was <clears throat> you're planning, but you're you're really designing a, a pipe that's going to be used pretty soon. Um, it, it went into construction, you know, a, a little while after I designed it, and now it's in service. Um, but when we do master plans and, and planning, a lot of the time I, my head is thinking about, you know, the year 2035 or 2040 and what the water demands, uh, and sanitary, um, or wastewater flows will be at that point in time with the population that is projected to be in whatever area I'm looking at at the time and planning infrastructure for that. Um, cause it doesn't just all of a sudden get here. Um, it, all of that infrastructure takes planning, um, beginning with the end in mind. Um, so that's, I, I got a little bit of an intro to that. And then I, I wound up switching firms, uh, to one that's, that's in Sarasota. And once I joined, um, it's called Corolo engineers. Once I joined Corolo, um, I got to do a lot more modeling. Um, so I, I focus a lot on hydraulic modeling now. Listening to STEM XM. I'm your host, Mel the Engineer, and this is episode 18 with Christiana Dragish. Okay, and so describe that for us because I, I think for somebody who's not, not at all familiar with um, your field, that would be really foreign to them. So mm-hmm. What and is even that? for people, yeah, <laughs> even for people that are in our field, sometimes look at me like, "How can you? How can you do that? How can you, you know, just look at the computer all day?" And I think it's really fascinating because I basically have an entire, you know, potable or reclaimed water distribution system at my fingertips, or a collection system at my fingertips. Um, all of those pipes that, you know, serve your house. They're connected to a bunch of other pipes that are connected to this treatment plant. And so there are a lot of, a lot of physics at work there. And that's what the hydraulic model does. It's basically, um, you know, looking at all of those pipes in the system and, you plug in different scenarios or options of things that could happen, like um, for potable water, we call them uh, different demands. So uh, say right now, you know, this is 2017, maybe we have an average demand of 50 million gallons a day. Well, if it was a day during the summer, 
when, you know, all of the snowbirds aren't here, it would probably be a lot less. Um, that's what happens in the, in the seasonal communities. Um, you know, there can be a big difference in the water demands between season and, and not season. Okay, so the the system that a municipality puts in the ground, it has to be able to handle not only the seasonal changes that that it experiences, you know, in the in now, but also it has to look forward is what you're saying. So they're, they're Mm -hmm. sitting there and you help them do this, right? So you say, okay, well, we're projecting a population increase or a decrease. And how do we make a system that can accommodate that? Right. Because infrastructure is so expensive. Yeah. So can you walk us through a little bit um, in a little bit more detail? You mentioned that there's there's a lot of physics involved. So Mm -hmm. like, again, for somebody who's not familiar, they may just be thinking, well, oh, you put a pipe in the ground. Like, how complex can it be? (laughs) Right. So could you explain that a little bit? Sure, sure. So yeah, it's funny. I've had somebody say that to me before. Like, doesn't that come designed already? Um, so there are, there are pumps at these treatment plants and they, they all have a specific, um, a specific point that they're supposed to operate at. And that means, um, let's see. So usually a a pump, it'll have a specific flow that it's supposed to put out. And it's supposed to put out that flow at a certain, they call it head, but what they're really talking about is, is pressure. And so pressure is the force over an area. Um, and so that's, that's all that is. And these pumps, they have to have enough pressure basically and, and the right amount of flow to be able to, they're basically pushing, they're pushing water from one place to another. And there are these losses associated with doing that. Like, just like if you're running, if you're running a marathon, you're, or a mile or whatever, you're losing energy as you, you're not losing energy. You're, you're spending the energy. It's being, um, transferred into a different state. Um, and it's the same thing with, with water, um, that water, just like if you are rubbing your feet, uh, against the, the carpet, creating a, a static charge, or if you're rolling down a hill and, um, or sliding something down a hill and at one point it stops, sometimes it's not at the bottom of the hill, um, it, it stops before the bottom and that's because of friction usually. And, um, the same thing happens with water. It's weird to think that water would have friction associated with it. It's a liquid, but, but it does. Um, and, and so it, it slows the, it slows the water down. Um, it has to have, the pumps have to have enough, um, power. They have to be able to push enough to, um, for that water to make it all the way to their customers. And if there are a lot of customers or if everybody has their, their faucet open at one time, it's a lot of water and it requires a a lot of power. Um, and so those are the those are the different things that, that we look at, um, in the model. And, uh, another thing that we look at on, it's, it's kind of a, a smaller scale, um, our surge analyses, and they're, uh, basically called water hammer events or transient events. And that's when, um, maybe something would get closed and stop the water that's being pushed. If, if a valve, 
uh, an isolation valve is closed really quickly. Um, the water that was, you know, charging in one direction, it gets stopped and it's kind of like a, a vibration. Um, and that force, uh, you know, then goes backwards and it can basically damage, um, damage equipment. Um, I don't want to get too far into the, into the weeds here. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. <laughs> like, details. Yeah. I, th- I think it's good to get into some of this. So you're kind of laying the groundwork, um, for us to talk to some, some professionals in this field that, that specialize in some other areas. So, um, I, cool. I do want to give, uh, you know, a good picture of, the the master plans that you work on and and these different aspects that you're describing that that have to go into it it's um i i feel like it's something behind the scenes that most citizens don't get to see so it's probably something they're unfamiliar with Mm -hmm. so yep i agree yeah so um i know that you've also got to look at like fire planning so that um, mm-hmm. when there's a fire, the firemen can hook up to the fire hydrant and everything. Could you talk about maybe sure. how that's accounted for? Yeah, um, that's a that's a really good question. So we call those in in the model we call those scenarios fire flow scenarios, and um, basically. Uh, there is a, a requirement that based on what kind of property you're serving, so the hydrant that's on my street right now, this is a residential area. So a, a residential area um, doesn't have as large of a requirement for fire flow. And the fire flow is basically the amount of water that the fire department is going to be able to get out of that hydrant um, without dropping the system pressure too much. Um, And if you're at a commercial place, maybe a restaurant or something like that, the fire flow requirements are usually higher. Um, You know, sometimes for residential, it's anywhere from 750 gallons per minute up to maybe 1,200 gallons per minute. And when you start looking at commercial um, commercial areas, it's, you know, uh, sometimes up around, I think, 3,000 uh, GPM. So that's a lot. It's a lot of water, and it takes a certain size pipe to be able to provide that because if the pipe is too small, all of those frictional, those losses that we were talking about, they get too great and they're not allowed, they, they don't have um, the amount of flow that they need. So it's important that, you know, the, the lines, the, the water mains are the correct size um, to be able to serve the fire hydrant. And that is typically the, um, like worst case scenario, if you will. Um, there are a lot of different demand scenarios that we look at. One of them is called peak hour. And that's basically a simulation of just that one hour of the day, uh, where everybody or a lot of people are using their water. And typically that is, um, in Florida, it's, and depending on the system, it, it's usually in the morning because of, uh, number one is irrigation. And number two is, you know, people waking up, taking their showers, getting ready for the day. Uh, and then, you know, everybody goes to work and there's not as much demand throughout the day. It, it's kind of level. And then you get another kind of peak uh, when people want the water again. They got home, they're cooking dinner, um, giving their kids a bath, 
Yeah, so that's that's um, a really interesting thing that you've brought up. So there's there's the seasonal aspect of water usage, and then there's this um, this kind of fluctuation daily. during the day. Yeah. So how how does a municipality manage that, and and does that come into play when you're helping them make a master plan? Uh, it. It comes into play a lot when we are doing the modeling and deciding which scenarios to run. And it's the foundation, like the models are the foundation which that master plan is brought, is, is, is built on. Um, but, you know, for, for those daily uh, fluctuations in water demand, we call those diurnal patterns or you can also call them demand patterns. Um, and I have calculated so many of them and they can be extremely complex because you have water that is maybe going into a storage tank so that they can use it later, but it's not actually going to a customer. Um, and you have to take that out of, you know, your equation, because what you're trying to do with that diurnal demand pattern is to, um, you're trying to simulate a customer's usage. So did I answer the question? (laughs) I think so. Yeah. Um, so (laughs) what, what other things are, are important to consider when you're when you're developing the master plan from a drinking water and wastewater perspective and how often do municipalities need to do these plans um that uh, those are great questions and it really depends on the municipality um for how i mean typically we recommend definitely every like five years, you need to have an updated master plan. Um, But it really depends on what the economy is like at the time, because things right now are changing very rapidly. And a a recent wastewater master plan that we did, uh, I mean, things just kept changing and changing. There were more developers um, putting in applications and, you know, we needed to factor them in and we were factoring them in, but it's just a, a different way of doing it. Whether we, you know, call it out as the development that it's going to be and give it its own pump station and the approximate number of people that are going to live there. Um, or we treat it as a, um, as part of a bigger area of, of land um, that will be developed in the future. So it's so to answer the question, I would say definitely every five years. And if things are changing really quickly, you should probably do them more frequently, um, you know, every, every three to five years, because it's, it, you know, a master plan is, is never done really. It, it just keeps changing with, um, with what's happening. You know, maybe the developer, that pump station that I put at that location in the model and they said they were going to build 400 new homes. I don't know, maybe the guy went bankrupt or decided to go into something else or to build elsewhere. And, um, you know, not at that location. So things always change, and that's why it's important to update those so that you have a good idea of what's going to happen um, and, and how you're going to get there. Right. Absolutely. So it sounds like when a, an, an area like a city or um, even a suburb is experiencing a lot of quick growth, it can be difficult um, it can be difficult for the municipality to uh, really plan for that. They almost have to just kind of mm-hmm. lay it down as they're going, right? Yeah, I mean it. I mean, sometimes people want to develop, or developers want to go somewhere where there 
there are no pipes. Um, you know, actually the location where, where I live, uh, it's called Lakewood Ranch and it's east of, um, I-75. And back when my husband was growing up out on Siesta Key, nobody wanted to live out here. Um, but at some point a developer said, you know what, I think we're going to develop this and people are going to want to live out here. And, you know, then, then there were pipes that were built and, um, you know, so it's, it's really interesting actually trying to, it's, it's like a, a crystal ball, you know, trying to figure out or decide and assume how, um, how things are going to be developed. Um, you know, especially in a big, a big county where there's lots of land to be developed. Um, you know, things can change a lot. Um, rather than someplace that, you know, if, if it's someplace like, um, uh, maybe St. Petersburg, uh, they, they don't have a lot of, um, there's no, there's no room. If you wanted to build something brand new, it would have to go in the place of something else, you know? So basically their, you know, their water and wastewater demand and flows are, you know, pretty, pretty constant or, you know, they, I don't think they'll be increasing a lot, you know, in the next 20 years or so. Um, but someplace where there's a lot of opportunity for, for growth, there's a lot of room, um, like Manatee County, for example, um, there, uh, there are just a million different ways that it could happen. <laughs> Right. So, so for for our listeners, uh, Saint Petersburg, Florida, is is kind of um, like a peninsula. It's surrounded by water, and it's it's almost completely developed on the entire mm-hmm. land area. So basically, um, I think what you are kind of saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you know there's piping infrastructure to all of these locations already. So it's not like there's expansion. There's there's a need, Correct. To, right, to update and and um, certainly replace um, pipes and whatnot that are bad, but um, there's not. And growth. there's not really a need to increase the size of those pipes either. If there's already, if everyone that's going to move there is already there, um, you know, or or if they don't have a lot of. Um, opportunity or not opportunity, um, like vacant, vacant parcels or vacant houses or vacant apartments, things like that. Um, you know, that's, that's something that we look at when we're doing a master plan as well is, you know, our, what, what are the vacant, vacant lands, um, and how, how much water are they going to need when it's developed? So, um, so yeah, St. Pete, I would think their, their pipes are probably going to stay the, stay the same size and just need to be, you know, replaced when they, when they're aged or when they need to be rehabilitated. You're listening to STEM XM. This episode is the second in a series on water and wastewater careers. You can listen to this episode again on iTunes, Stitcher, or directly on the episode's show notes page, which is located at stemxm.com forward slash episode 18. We would be so grateful also if you would consider sharing the STEMXM podcast as a resource to students, teachers, or school counselors you know who might find this information beneficial. I'm Mel the Engineer. Thank you for listening. Okay, so you you brought up a couple interesting things just now. Um, so let's go back for a second to you. You were using Manatee County as, as an example. Mm-hmm. So um, you, you've got a, a place where there's there's still a lot of undeveloped land that could be developed. Uh, can mm-hmm. you t- can you explain? 
for our listeners, if a developer wants to put, say, a subdivision somewhere that's kind of out of the way and there's not there's not um, drinking water pipes going out there already, why could that be an issue and what does the municipality have to think about in terms of providing safe drinking water? Right. So, um, great question. Um, usually people now want the, um, want water from a county or a city, um, if, if it's available. Um, but if, if a developer was going to put a bunch of homes out, out in the country, um, and they wanted that service, but there were no pipes there. Um, you know, they either need to pay for the line to be installed or come to some kind of an agreement with the municipality um, about sharing the sharing the costs. Um, but it, you know, it all depends on you know the timeline of when when they're going to build it and when it'll actually be, uh, inhabited. (laughs) Um, and, uh, you know, just making all of those pieces of the puzzle come together. So, um, (laughs) I, I, I want to hit on, on something a little bit here with respect to water age. Can, can Mm -hmm. you talk about the issues that are, that, that could happen due to old water age. Okay. Okay. That, yeah. And that, so that's another scenario that we run in the, uh, drinking water models is water age. And what happens is, um, so right now we're, we're in the season, the tourist season. There are a lot of snowbirds here, people from out of state, um, and up north come and inhabit their their homes and live here for six months or so from uh, around October, November through Easter, I think. And uh, so right now, the system has a low water age on average because there are lots of people here and they are demanding that water from the system. And in the summer months, when all of those people have gone home and we've got about half the number of people here, uh, what happens is the water that is in the distribution system sometimes can, it can sit there for a little while because you don't have as many people on the other end of their taps, um, you know, the faucets opening them up and wanting that water. Um, And so that's another reason why, you know, pipe size is so important because if you have a system that was built for this, was basically overbuilt for, you know, that's, that's the danger of, you know, going off of a, uh, or the risk I should say of going off of a master plan or something that was planned maybe during the, the big boom when everything was really escalating, um, and, growth was just these giant, um, projections. And, um, if you went off of that assumption and made a a pipe, let's say 48 inches in diameter, um, and it really didn't need to be, uh, you would get high water age at the end of that pipe. Um, so the water just basically gets stagnant and it sits there. And when you have pipes in the distribution system, um, you know, some of them are, uh, metallic pipes. Um, it's not like they're accessible to be cleaned. Um, if they're sitting there for a long time or if the, if the water is sitting there, there are a few things that are happening. Number one, the chlorine is degrading. And so as that's happening, um, 
it really, um, it can allow, you know, bacteria and things, um, to get back into the water. So usually what we'll do is we'll do flushing, uh, and use those fire hydrants to actually flush old water out of the system. If we have an issue, maybe there's a, maybe there's a neighborhood that has a lot of snowbirds that in June and July, there's no one there. And so there's water just sitting there. And if you go and take a reading for chlorine or something, it's going to be really low because the water's been sitting there for a while. So what we'll do is open some fire hydrants or what the county or city will do is open fire hydrants uh, to basically, they call it turn the water over so that you bring fresh water in that has the chlorine residual. Right. So this is an important public health um, concern that the municipality, city or county takes into account to make sure that, um, you know, the water that you're getting at your tap uh, has some residual disinfectant in it like chlorine and there's not um, bad bugs in there. So mm-hmm, it's, mm-hmm. it's an interesting piece um, that, that has to be considered in all of this. So the, the other thing that I wanted to go back to was, um, so the example of, of St. Petersburg where it's it's kind of developed out. Um, mm-hmm. if, if a city like that wanted help with a master plan, how do you help them plan for replacing old infrastructure that needs oh. needs to be updated? How do they know what? Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talk to us about that. I, sure. Okay. So that's cool. That's a, It's another thing that I like to do. And we call it um, asset management and R&R plans. Um, and there are, again, a bunch of different ways that, that you can do this, but it, it starts with getting an inventory of what they have. And usually that's, all of that data is stored in um, that program called GIS, Geographic Information Systems, that I brought up earlier, that mapping software. And usually there's a, a network of, of pipes and... Um, all of their facilities in this um, in this software, and it'll have different things about the pipes, like when it was installed, uh, what diameter it is, what material it is, and so usually we start by um, you know going through getting an inventory, and then we look at the the different materials that they have. And um, each of those materials has a different original useful life. Um, A PVC pipe, which is a a plastic one, they, if they're installed correctly and they're operated correctly, um, or if the facilities uh, connected to them are operated properly, then um, PVC should have a life of around 75 years. But some other uh, materials like concrete um, or ductile iron or cast iron, those usually have a, a lower original useful life. And so we go through and... Um, figure out which pipes are um, which pipes are, are vulnerable to, to failing uh, based on how much of that lifespan that they have left. Um, another important piece of um, those asset management and R and R plans are is condition assessment. And uh, what What's really cool when you have um, like a ductile iron pipe is uh, you can, on an exposed piece of it, if you have the right piece of equipment, um, you can actually use this this meter um, that will tell you the thickness of the pipe. And you can test around the, the circumference of the 
of the pipe. And if you do this, well, if you know enough about that pipe and you know what the original thickness of that pipe was, you can tell whether it is, um, you know, experiencing excessive internal corrosion. Sometimes the pipe is, uh, you know, I've seen it before that the pipe looks like it is increasing in thickness over time. And it's because of the, the rust accumulating um, on the inside of the pipe. Um, similarly, you know, you have the place where that rust is, is coming from. Basically, it, it comes from just another piece of the, of the pipe. And so there's another location of that pipe that is going to have a decreased uh, wall thickness. Um, and depending on what kind of pipe it is, you can assess condition in a number of ways. You can use um, cameras and put cameras down the pipes. Um, you can do that when they're out of service and the pipelines are empty. And there are even some technologies where you can do it when they're full. Um, sending in uh, a, there's a little ball car, called the smart ball. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, are, is it like a submarine? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's this little ball that, I mean, you can track it. You can see where it is, X, Y, Z coordinates, and it gives you all sorts of information. Um, you know, like, um, I don't know if that one gives thickness measurements or not, but, um, you know, some of the technologies will give you whether there's air pockets in a pipe and that's something that we didn't really talk about before with the design, but you don't want to have air in the pipe, um, but it accumulates at some places. Um, and so, you know, we'll put an air release valve uh, on a pipe to bleed off that, that air. And it's, it usually accumulates at a, at a high point in the, in the pipe. So um, we're talking about um, drinking water specifically. Could you explain for us why why we don't want air in the pipe? Well, there there are a few different reasons. Um, first of all, it it reduces the hydraulic capacity of the of the line. Um, if you have an air pocket that's there, then that's a portion of the pipe that's not filled up with water. And so it changes the velocity of the, of the water at that location. Let's see. I mean, it's not, it's not great to have them in, um, force mains either. Um, that's why, you know, in, in any, in any pressurized pipe, when you have, um, when you have flow going through it, you always want to minimize the air. If, if there's enough of an air pocket, um, when an event like that water hammer, that surge event that I was talking about earlier, if something like that happens, I mean, the pipe can explode. So, and that's something that, you know, I, I don't think anyone thinks about, but, but us, but it's really important. And if, you know, nobody thinks about it. It would just, I mean, nobody would have water. <laughs> right, right. So um, you, you, you just mentioned the phrase force main. And so mm. I want, I want to clarify for the, for the listeners. So, so drinking water is always under pressure and yep. um, municipal wastewater that's con conveyed from your house to the, the wastewater treatment plant, it it uh, could be under pressure in some places where it's a, a force main, or it, or it could be flowing by gravity in, in some places. Do you do you um, plan for those things as well when you're doing a master plan? Definitely. Um, we so in a in a development like from my house. It, our wastewater just flows by gravity to a, a gravity main 
um, that's in the center of the street. And it, it, you know, all, all of the other neighbors, it all goes into this pipe and it winds up at a lift station. It's a pump station. And that pump station then takes all of that water. It collects it in these um, underground storage tanks. They call them wet wells. Um, and then it, it pumps it into a pressurized wastewater main, which we call a force main. Um, but, you know, in, in Florida, I think for master plans, um, it, it depends on what kind of system it is and the detail that you're looking at, but usually, um, we do not plan gravity that is like upstream of a lift station, if you will. So we wouldn't plan the gravity mains going down the streets that are, you know, dumping into this lift station. Um, usually we would just start at the, at that pump station that's serving that development and say, okay, there's going to be 144 people or 144 homes and in that are served by this pump station. And, um, there's two people in every house and, you know, each one of them is going to use, I don't know, 85 gallons per day. Um, you know, and we would go from there. Um, we would, sometimes those force mains, those pressurized pipes actually dump into big gravity mains. Um, there are, they call them collectors. Um, there are giant gravity mains that are, uh, that are not pressurized, that just flow, um, by, by gravity. And so, in a master plan, we would definitely consider um, and plan for those big gravity mains that connect parts of the system, but not so much the smaller ones. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for explaining that. You're welcome. Um, so I, I have just a few more questions for you. Um, sure. I wanted to ask... Um, what is something or even a couple of things that you deal with on a regular basis in your job that you think, um, you know, your everyday person doesn't know about it, or maybe they have a misunderstanding about it? Hmm. Oh, gosh. Um. Hmm. Well... This kind of relates to that, but, you know, I, th I think that the general consensus of uh, just people in general is that you need to be a real math whiz to do engineering, um, and I, I have not found that to be the case. I do not think that I'm the best at math, definitely not. Um but I can make it work for me when I need to. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's, that's definitely not required. Um, let's see though, something that is not understood. Hmm. I don't know. Can we come back to that one? Yeah, we can come back I'm to that. I'm going to have to think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I wonder if, if there's, um, you know, something that you've noticed in, in a conversation with a friend or family member that, um, maybe kind of made you think that, Hey, you know, people who are not in this field, they totally don't get this or, you know, hmm. they have some kind of, well, yeah. I mean, I guess one thing is something that we've already talked about and it's, um, you know, the fact that there's chlorine in the water and it needs, you know, we need a certain amount of chlorine in that water because some of the pipes that are in the ground have been there for 40 years. Um, and it, it's just not realistic. It's not possible to go in there with a toothbrush and clean them. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so we we need to keep that. Um, we we need to have chlorine in the water, um, and it's something that you know a, a lot of people I think um, they they think is bad that that there's chlorine in the water, but it's it's actually something that we definitely need. Um, I think a common misconception is that you know bottled water is better than tap water and a lot of the time bottled water is the same thing as tap water it's just from a different location <laughs> you know it's water that has been treated somewhere and put into a bottle um and something I think to be wary of is, you know, if you have a giant 48 pack or whatever of that water sitting in your car and it gets hot, you know, you have the chemicals from that plastic that are, you know, like leaching into that, um, water, um, you know, and, and at home, I mean, I, I have a, a Brita filter, um, or you can put a filter on your refrigerator, um, and that works just great. Um, I definitely would recommend just using using one of those and minimizing, you know, bottled water, except when, you know, you need to. There's sometimes when it's really convenient and you just um, can't avoid it, but I generally don't go anywhere without my my Arctic Yeti tumbler that, you know, keeps the water cold all day. Right. And I, th I think one thing we should highlight here, too, is that, you know, the EPA has an extensive set of criteria mm -hmm. um, that a drinking water treatment plant has to meet. I was just going to say there are, um, you know, bad things that can grow in the water like cryptosporidium and and some other nasty little creatures so what I'll do is I'll um, pull together some details on that and put that in the show notes um, and I'm hoping to get somebody on the show that that specializes in drinking water treatment I think I've got someone lined up so um, I'll go into that more with um, somebody on a future episode um, so, Christiana, um, with you, I've just got uh, a couple more questions. I wanted to ask, what do you love most about your work? Uh, let's see. I really like that um, I am a professional problem solver. I used to be intimidated by the fact that there sometimes there's no one right answer for a problem that I'm working on. Um, but now it just makes it that much more fun that there are so many different ways that you can solve a problem. Um, and I feel like I can just solve anything with the right modeling scenario or the right spreadsheet. Um, that's, that's what I really love is, you know, getting to solve new interesting problems. And I love being able to help my clients um, to do this, you know, this service that is so um, just kind of underappreciated and, and taken for granted because you don't see those pipes under the ground. You don't see the pump stations. They don't want you to see the pump stations because, you know, they, they usually will cover those up with nice trees and, um, you know, landscaping so that, uh, so that you don't see that. But, um, but it's there and it's very important for, um, for life and health. Um, yeah, I'm really, really proud to be a part of um, this profession. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then You're welcome. my last question is, do you have any advice for young students who are interested in this career path? And if there's anything specific to young women, I'd love to hear that too. Sure. Um, you know, I think for 
gosh, for, for anyone who's interested, I would suggest um, looking into an association. Um, there are lots of different professional societies out there that unite professionals in whatever area that you want to um, that you want to study. And I'm very involved with one called the Florida Water Environment Association. And I'm also a member of the American Water Works Association. And I have met so many wonderful people through those associations. And I, I met the people that I work with now in, in those associations. Uh, so that's a, definitely a key piece of advice. Um, and just, let's see what else. Um, other than that, I would just say never stop learning. I mean, now that we have Google, I, I mean, Google was not there when I was <laughs> looking into different professions. Um, and it, you've, you've got it at your fingertips. Um, there, there are lots of different, um, lots of different things online that you can learn to further your knowledge. And I mean, get yourself a mentor, um, go shadow someone, um, to see if, if you would like what they do and don't be intimidated if it doesn't make sense because, I mean, it took me a long time to, to figure things out and feel comfortable in what I do. Right. And that's to be expected. You know, I think, I think everybody has to go through that in, in some shape or form. And I completely agree with your advice about involvement with the association. So, mm-hmm. uh, the two that you mentioned, I'll put links to those in the show notes. So, uh, Florida Water Environment Association and American Water Works Association. Um, mm-hmm. And for our listeners, I'll just note real quick that um, in the previous episode, Stacy mentioned WEF, Water Environment Federation. Mm-hmm. And so FWEA is actually the state level of WEF. Um, so yeah. there's, there's uh, some overlap there. So I'll put that in the show notes. And uh, Christiana, I just want to thank you for taking the time with us today. It was great to talk to you. Thank You're you. You're so welcome. Oh, thank you for sharing about um, your work with municipalities and and master planning. It was just a really great chat. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm yeah, I I really enjoyed it. So I hope that um, your listeners enjoy it and that they learn something. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening. Christiana and I exchanged a few messages after the show and she had a couple additional thoughts to add. So I'm going to read directly from her message right here. Also, one of my favorite things about my job is working with the team that I work with. I get excited to come into work because I get to solve tough problems for our clients with brilliant engineers. And 99% of the problems that I solve are problems that are completely unknown to the public. Something that I wanted to tell the girls listening is that you can be yourself and still be a successful and respected engineer. I love fashion, used to model and do makeup and teach dance classes in my spare time. You do not need to be that stereotypical engineer to be successful. Being yourself is a lot more fun. And that's great advice. Be yourself. So a big thank you to Christiana for coming onto the show and sharing her additional thoughts and advice with us. You can find this episode show notes at stemxm.com slash episode 18. That's stemxm.com forward slash episode and then the number 18, 18. Stay tuned for the next in our series on water and wastewater, and I'll catch up with you in episode 19. This is Mel the Engineer signing off. This has been an episode of the STEM XM podcast. Thank you for listening. We would really love if you could pop over to iTunes and give us an honest, positive rating. It helps more listeners find us to learn about STEM careers. Thanks again. 
Cheers, and we'll catch you on the next episode.